How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. I'm an Ableton certified trainer, musician, producer out of New York. And this is the show where we talk about all things related to music production. And I think today's going to be a really cool episode for that because my guest is Drew Vespers, who runs Warp Academy, an Ableton certified training center. And Drew is a master, producer, musician, saxophonist. He's a great teacher. I've had the privilege of working with him in the company in the past, producing a jumpstart um, Ableton Push 2 video course, which was a lot of fun. And I learned a lot about making courses, actually going through that myself. And um, he's also... Um, doing some interesting stuff um like one of his most recent videos was about like productivity hacks uh so some personal development stuff which i think we're going to get into too which i'm excited to talk about because i think um you know as you improve in production and your habits it kind of improves everything in your life and vice versa as you improve your life um it improves all that he was just showing me his giant box of cherry tomatoes that he eats for his health and he's gonna (laughs) probably share some of those (laughs) tips but before we get started i want to tell you about two special gifts that drew has generously given the listeners of this podcast he's got a mixed template which you can download and also the song structure and energy heat maps. Now these are some techniques he uses that are part of his mod method. It's a video course you can check out and I'll give you a quick description. The mod method is a new approach, it's a methodology, it's a philosophy, it's a high structured workflow designed just for you, the producers of tomorrow who do everything for themselves. It is a way of dividing and conquering each phase of the production process and outpacing other producers who work randomly and bounce around multitasking. The mod method will redefine how you approach the studio. It'll give you the tools and inspiration to start creating and finishing music that you're proud of. So you can get these two downloads, the mix template and the song structure and energy heat maps if you check out the show notes of this podcast. And now, Drew, thanks a lot for joining us. I'm glad to have you here. Awesome. Yeah, man. Thanks so much, Brian. Appreciate you having me. Uh, I know we've been trying to line this up for a long time and we're both two busy guys. So it's nice to actually uh, finally uh, sit uh, face to face digitally. And yeah, I'm stoked to be here, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's it's super cool for me to have you here because, um, you know, we've um, definitely had some chats in the past um, and it's always been great. Uh, but it's also been like in the context of like getting some jobs done. So it'll be kind of nice just to, you know, dive into some of our uh, our passion here. 100%. Yeah. Happy to uh, share anything I can that'll be useful. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think everyone's going to enjoy it quite a lot. So um, I was wondering if maybe you can just kind of catch everybody up on who you are, what you're doing here, and... Um, you know, I, I have a feeling that a large number of people listening to my podcast probably know you as well as we're in a very similar circle. So maybe you can just catch everybody up for us. Yeah, awesome, man. Great. So um, yeah, broadly, I'm uh, an electronic music producer, sound designer, and audio engineer. I train other music producers how to do what I do. And I also do a lot of um, underground sound design ghost writing and production work. And I mean production work as a producer in the more traditional sense where I, I work with artists one-on-one and help them to um, create awesome music. So my, my passion in life uh, and why I started Warp Academy and why I started to get into training in Ableton is to uh, empower other music producers to create exceptional music and to live their passion. And so that's what Warp Academy is about. Warp Academy, I realized that that vision was going to, take a lot more than just me. And I started to come across after getting certified by Ableton back in 2010, I started to meet up with other really talented folks that had skill sets in different areas than me. And uh, guys like yourself, uh, Jake Perrine, my co-founder with Warp Academy, and many, many others who've joined our team. And uh, they've added to the expanded vision of, of being able to help um, many thousands of other music producers to up their game and uh, to be able to carve out careers or if career in music isn't really their ambition, just to make badass music. So yeah, Warp Academy is the platform where we do all of that. And I'm sure we'll get lots more into detail about uh, Warp Academy throughout the presentation, but that's a, a quick little summary. Um, you touched on it. I, I produce music as Vespers. That's my artist moniker. Uh, currently working with Westwood Recordings, 
and uh, Adapted Records. I have some releases out with both of those labels. And uh, I am right now kind of focused on, I've, I've been loosely in the bass music field, but I also really enjoy future bass. Uh, I really dig uh, just straight up hip hop, future R&B and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I'm up to artistically uh, myself right now. Mm. And you're also a um, saxophonist. And I think that's something for me that um, sort of like uh, distinguished a lot of your work from the crowd as um, you know, you're, you're, you're playing sax. I remember you had the, I think it was a glitch my sax up video, which was super cool. Um, so it seems like that's like, that's been an influence. I have, did you start playing saxophone like as a kid in school or uh, was it something you took up later in life? Yeah, I, uh, I took it up in elementary school. Mm. So um, I started off uh, playing classical piano, as many people do. Yes. Um, don't ever start your bio as an artist off like that. But you have <laughs> no idea how many artist bios. I started playing classical piano when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did. I started playing classical piano when I was five. Uh, but uh, then I got into saxophone in, I think it was around... I was about 11. It was when concert band started to come into play with school. And it's always a mad dash for the saxophone. The saxophone is the yeah. most popular instrument. So it, like in my school, they basically were like, there was no real process. It was just like, okay, so what uh, instruments do you want to play, kid? I like literally like shoved everyone else aside and I got there first and I was like, saxophone! <laughs> and, I, and I claimed it. It was like, a, nice. it was like... A, it was like a scene out of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Yeah. Just nothing else matters. Ah, saxophone. <laughs> this is Sparta. Right. I remember that day well, actually. I was looking for the drums uh, yeah. when I was a kid, and I didn't get it. They signed me up as a flute. And I think I was the only boy uh, for, <laughs> you know, for whatever reason. I, I don't understand why. But, um, uh, so I didn't do it. I didn't get involved in like band and all that stuff. Um, so my music life didn't really start till I was a teenager with a guitar. So I kind of oh, yeah. missed all that. And like, there's a part of me that's, um, you know, likes that, you know, because I think it um, made me just approach music a little differently. But there's also the part of me that's like, damn, you know, if I would have had like seven extra years in the beginning, you know, there's a, that formative young mind you know, learning music, I think that would have been pretty awesome. <laughs> you, you could have been a master flautist. That could have been the, be, the beginning of my bio. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, about the flute, uh, I'm almost coming for full circle back to that because I'm, uh, I'm actually quite interested in learning the flute right now because mm -hmm. the, a lot of saxophonists also play flute because the fingerings are nearly the same. So I actually have a flute and mm -hmm. uh, I'm terrible at it right now because the mm -hmm. embouchure is different, but I'm, I'm going to be working on it because yeah. I thought actually playing flute and saxophone in a show would be uh, pretty sweet. I don't know if you guys have ever seen, there's a guy named Greg Patillo who mm -hmm. beatboxes into a flute and it's, oh, cool. it's, it's pretty sweet actually. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I've seen like, a couple of people doing some interesting flute work um, with uh, just, um, live looping even it's been pretty cool um just it's a very expressive instrument actually i had no idea you could do so much like percussive stuff with it yeah totally mm -hmm. totally yeah i love seeing people push the boundaries with instruments for sure yeah exactly you know like Jimi hendrix and you know, all that stuff like definitely cool it's like a revolution coming or something no doubt so um, that is a, a nice background story. Uh, 2010, I'm almost surprised you weren't certified earlier than that because I do remember when I first got my copies of Ableton Live, um, your videos were some of the first that I saw. You, Tom Cosm, um, and a couple other people were out there on YouTube. And this is like you know 2008 or so where we're just realizing YouTube is an amazing learning platform. And you were right on there right from the beginning, for me at least. So I thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, I started doing um, videos on Ableton Live. Uh, and actually, before I even was a live user, I was doing videos on Cubase. <laughs> I think mm. the videos are still on there on my YouTube channel, actually. It's the very first couple of videos that I did. Uh, yeah, I was, did videos before I was certified. Mm. Um, and then I got certified later and uh, continued doing the videos. But I was already in a good routine of of doing videos, I think, which, which actually helped me to get certified. Because when I did my initial interview, they were like, yeah, we've seen your stuff. Uh, 
it's it's good uh you want to get certified <laughs> <laughs> wasn't as easy as that but definitely it helped uh, yeah i did the same thing you know i was out putting videos i was putting out videos before i even knew how to use ableton live i just had learned how to use the sampler and how to build some instrument racks so i was just sharing those and i was very surprised that you get this like perceived expert thing going on as soon as like you start showing people teaching, they think you know how to do it. <laughs> Which I've I also learned this as a high school teacher too. They they assume you know everything about English in my case, and it's like, nah, I have to look that one up. Shh, don't burst the bubble. <laughs> no, man, it gets me off the hook. You know, <laughs> I don't have to live up to this impossible, uh, you know, <laughs> image or whatever. Yeah, totally, mm. totally. Yeah, there's something to be said for teaching um, and getting deeper into into stuff. You know, whenever, you know, as you can imagine with with live, um, there's so much to know. And mm-hmm. I get booked to speak at conferences and, and teaching on a particular subject. You know, I mm-hmm. and preparing my presentation. Invariably, I always discover something new that wasn't wasn't uh, part of my knowledge base before. So uh, yeah, it's actually I think it's a real privilege and a gift uh, being in teaching because uh, I learn things from my students all the time too. Yeah. You know. They're figuring stuff out or asking questions that I hadn't contemplated, and yeah, it's a really it's a really rewarding field to be in for sure. Yeah, I always kind of walk away from my classes feeling like I'm the one that learned the most. And if you want to learn something, you know, figure out how to teach it. I think it's an incredible method. So, what year did you start Warp Academy then? We started uh, building it in 2012, and we launched it in um, late 2013. Um, early 2014 is when we um, have the site as it appears today. Right. Yeah. So not actually that long ago. Well, you know, a little over five years. Yeah. Uh, feels like a long time, but uh, lots changed in the industry since we since we launched. So feels like a long time as a result. Yeah. Well, it's come a long way. You have physical locations at this point, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, we do yeah i have uh, a we've had a couple of different uh studio spaces that we've experimented with mainly for producing um our video courses as well as doing the studio work that i do as an audio engineer and uh currently we have uh the studio as you see it in my in my current videos it's a room mm-hmm. that was uh our first room that we've had designed from the ground up by uh an acoustician um, mm. And it's been a lovely space to work into with fully custom done acoustic treatment and and uh, speakers that are recessed uh, and flush mounted into the walls mm. and like all the all the acoustic testing done for bass music, you know, for the for oh, okay. system that's capable yeah. of L- lots of LFE. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Yeah, and it does look beautiful in the uh, in the videos. I hope to one day Thank you. make it out and check it out. See what you yeah. got going on there. Oh, you will. You will. Yeah, come and come and have some tomatoes. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there's a good reason to come, I guess. <laughs> so, um, I think, uh, you know, one of the things you said you were getting into a lot lately was um, advanced mixing. Um, you'd mentioned that in the email um, that we were corresponding with. And I was kind of curious, like, what you mean by that exactly? Yeah, of course. So, I... Uh, in the position that I'm in as a teacher um, and having a community that's as large as Warp Academy, uh, I have the uh, ability to kind of see what people are struggling with on a mass scale. You know, I, I'm not usually just working with one-on-ones. I'm working with groups. Um, and at this point, I've worked with um, many, many thousands of people at some point. And I've always seen that mixing is something that people struggle with near the top. You know, there's a few... There's a few main items that a lot of music producers struggle with sound design is another one songwriting is another one the music business is another one so there's these big areas that a lot of people invariably encounter some struggle in because uh they're they can be very very technically complex and so the when it comes to mixing there's a delineation between the between mixing electronic music and mixing other forms of music in that electronic music is many, many times more sophisticated from an engineering perspective. You're talking about wall of sound type of stuff. You're talking about louder music than any other genre. Uh, You're talking about layered sounds, a lot of electronically created sounds. And the mixing process to be able to get that to sound really clean and really good and, and engineer it to sound good on both a PA maybe a 300,000 watt 
sound system, function one PK at a music festival, or also to sound good on laptop speakers, you need to have electronic music is listened to in all of these different destinations. So the level of technical sophistication that goes into the mixing is, is nuts. And I found that uh, it's a, a top area of struggle, mainly because it takes about as much time to learn how to mix electronic music at a professional level as it takes to do a high level graduate university degree, like a master's or a PhD. Um, the, the types of techniques that you're employing to get mixes to sound good build on layers and layers of foundational material that also take a long time to develop. And beyond that, mixing, it's not just around having the knowledge. Like, I, I'm good at mixing now. I've been doing it for 15 years. But if you put me in a, a bad room, I'll make poor quality mixing decisions. Mm -hmm. If I'm listening in an environment where there's room resonances and modes, um, I'll be chasing ghosts in the mix. So your, your environment that you're mixing in, the equipment that you're using, your knowledge of your tools, all of that takes um, a lot, a lot of time to, to learn. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely a big one. I mean, even just, I mean, I'm clearly, you can see, not in the proper room for high-end audio production in a lot of cases. So um, it's uh, amazing what you find when you take a mix into another location. And like, I think that's why uh, so many of us have problems when we try to hear our mix, say, in the car, and it's like, well, what the heck's going on there? And you take it somewhere else, and there's a different issue that pops up. And to have that neutral space, I mean, that's uh, that's always the best, but um, not always possible, especially for um, you know, the uh, the home studio enthusiast type of thing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Hence, where a lot of the challenge comes from is the recording or mixing environment mm -hmm. is um, necessarily. An ideal if you're dealing with a room like the room that I'm in here today. I'm on the road. This is a, a friend's studio. This is a studio that um, I helped do uh, a full acoustic treatment on. And this room had a lot of issues before we started. Um, it's a basically a square box, which is mm -hmm. the worst acoustic environment that you want to be in. We're actually going to be releasing a video on the saga of treating this room uh, with oh, cool. Warp Academy on the YouTube channel pretty soon because we filmed the whole installation process and we actually um, also did full acoustic testing uh, for every step along the way. So you can actually see the graphs of the frequency response and the waterfall of the room change as we add things like mm. a ceiling cloud and bass traps and stuff like that. So listening environment is, is huge. And then also training your ears because at the beginning, you just you can't hear what a compressor is doing. And so most people at the beginning, they totally overdo compression and they totally overdo EQ and overdo reverb because they can't hear the nuances of mm -hmm. um, how much is enough. And that takes, it just takes time to develop. You know, what does an overcompressed snare sound like? Um, it's not obvious at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, I can yeah. remember watching videos and they're tweaking something like, oh, doesn't that sound much better? And you're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, that just, sounds uh, the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> Right. My general rule of thumb to combat that, you know, kind of with a knowledge in my head that like I'm probably missing subtle things, I generally do the effect until I notice it and then just drop it back a little bit. Like if it's a reverb, say, you know, like I, I want to hear it and then it's like, okay, well, I'm going to just pull it down a little bit more than although maybe even a tad more. I'd rather underdo it than overdo it. I've ruined so many mixes with putting compressors on every channel, EQing every single sound, uh, only to take all of that stuff off, you know, just bypass every effect and realize it sounds way better before I even did anything to it. Yeah, we've all had mixes like that for sure. I've had plenty of those too. Actually, that technique that you mentioned is a really, really good one. And it's one that I teach in my uh, mixing training. I call it the invisible reverb. So mm -hmm. you begin nudging, nudging up your send into that return track until you can overtly hear it then you nudge it back until you can't really hear it. But if you if you mute it, you hear that it's missing, yeah. but you can't really overtly hear that it's in. And that's uh, that's a good way to dial in reverb. It's a it's a it's a great technique. Yeah, I think a lot of effective elements of a mix are the types of things that you don't notice they are there until they are gone. Totally, and, because everything can't be the most exciting thing in the mix. You can't have you can't have the super loud 
bass, the super loud pad, the awesome guitar on top. You, you just, everything can't be the hugest thing in the song because then nothing's huge. Yep. Uh, it's, it's a very weird, like, I guess it's like a paradox, you know, in the real world, the more things you add, the louder it gets and the more in, insane it is. But in a mix, it almost makes everything smaller in those mm -hmm. little speakers that you have compared to just your natural environment. Totally. Yeah. There's no, uh, there's no headroom limit in the real mm. world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of like, uh, manipulating that and being aware. And I think just as the, per if, especially if you're a solo producer, you're the one that did all of the parts. You made the drums, you made the bass, you made the pad, whatever it is. It's kind of like in the band when like the guitar player wants to keep turning up his amp. So he goes up and then just, he wants to be the loudest, but you're the guitar player on every single instrument in the song so you want to always jack things up a bit mm -hmm. yeah the bias towards you know you as the creator of all those sounds yes um you you want all of them to shine and uh that's one thing that i find a lot of my uh my students struggle with is when i get in there and i start showing them that everything has to have a, a pocket that it goes into and you can't have more than two things you can't have more than one thing actually in in each pocket and mm -hmm. as soon as you start stacking things up in those areas, you lose clarity in the mix and they're stepping on each other and you get frequency masking. And so um, a lot of times people really lament and have a hard time cutting things out. And a lot of times what I do as a producer is I'm saying, you know, a choice needs to be made. Um, mm -hmm. We can get really crafty with the mix, but if there's say seven or eight things in the mix in the arrangement at that point in time, um, no amount of mixing is going to be able to nudge those around and retain clarity. And I'm not talking about layers of things. I'm talking about main sounds, right? Right. So, um, you know, once you fill up your 3D box that, that the mix is, um, and if you, you have to cut things that exceed that. And it, it means taking them out. And a lot of times people are get a real precious about sounds that they've created. But that's the objective part about being a producer and, and why sometimes it can be really good to work with uh, an objective third party. And this is why people work with me because I come in with fresh ears and I'm listening to their reference songs that they give me. And I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't have four pad sounds in the reference song. You have four pad sounds. It's like, mm -hmm. let's maybe have one really, really good pad sound that takes up the de back of the depth stage in the mix. And then it's going to leave room for other things to, to really shine. Yeah. I know my early days, I wanted to add everything because now I have infinite tracks on my computer. You know, I used to dream of that when I had a four track cassette recorder. But I, I have yeah. learned that like a good mix really starts in the arrangement and just yeah. selecting the elements. Yeah, hundred percent. I um, I think that uh, I want to do a a video at some point on this. But uh, I uh, I do a, a course at Warp Academy called the Mod Method, and it's about modularizing the music production process mm -hmm. and game game planning out your thinking like a mix engineer as you're choosing your initial sounds. And so one of the things that I teach in that course is starting from a guide track, uh, like a reference track, right? Mm -hmm. You have a, a track that you want to use as a, as a template. Some people might call these ghost tracks. It's a track that you put in and you learn from, but that you delete out of the, out of the session. And it's just kind of influenced your decisions. So if you take a song that you really, really, really like, and it just slams, the mix is great. It sounds good. It sounds full. It's not, it doesn't have too much of anything. It's not missing anything. And you, at the very beginning, before you even get started in the studio, uh, I anchor the build, I call it Hallet. So think of it, um, they're taking um, their palette out and they're putting in all the different colors that they're going to use in this particular piece. And they get those lined up before they approach the canvas. And that's how I define the sound design process. And to figure out what paints you want to put on, on your palette, uh, you learn from the arrangement of a reference track. So I encourage my students to go through a reference track that they really like and just make a bulleted list of everything they hear. So like, okay, we got a kick drum, we've got a snare drum, but in the breakdowns, there's claps. We've got a hi-hat, open, closed hi-hat. You differentiate between all the little micro sounds. And then you might say in the, you know, in the drop, there's this call and response bass line. So there's two separate bass synths or many times more in genres like glitch hop or dubstep. And there's a lead vocal and you identify all the little granular parts and you just list them. And then when you go to curate sounds and begin making sounds for your own song, you basically have a checklist. 
So when you're dealing with uncertainty and you're trying to create in a vacuum, you don't really know what's too much or what's too little. You might have gaps, but this process kind of bulletproofs that because you just have a checklist. And when you can narrow your focus and, and bring it down to just having like a checklist that you go through, it, uh, it speeds you up and makes you more effective and you create higher quality music at that point. Hmm. I do um, a Berkeley online class um, sampling Ableton Live technique sampling. And um, one of our projects is to make your, your own track. You know, that's like the final project, make your, make your song using the sampling techniques. And I really stress the first step in the process of planning and just having an idea. I mean, I, I love going into the studio and seeing where the wind takes me and fi- vibing with my feelings and, you know, feeling all artistic and creative. And, but most of the time when I do that, nothing really ever comes of it. But when I have a very specific idea, um, it helps quite a lot. And um, what you're saying sounds like a really great way to, to focus and, um, you know, know what you're going to do. Um, but I'm, I'm curious what your um, response would be to something I hear a lot is that by doing much like what you said, like kind of picking out what the, the reference track has, those elements, um, people will tell me like they, they feel like they're not being creative, they're copying, they're not making anything original. And I'm curious how you approach that, that comment, if you've heard that. Totally. Before. Oh, yeah, yeah, we've heard that for sure. And it can be a dangerous... Um, a dangerous path to use reference tracks exactly for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, you want to have something to inspire you because creating from a blank canvas is, is um, very, very difficult. And a lot of producers have a hard time getting going, um, you know, creating in a vacuum like that. And so I like to have the reference track give me that hit list of what types of sounds, but what it's not doing is telling me what order to play them in. Um, I'm not saying with the reference track, uh, I think the the downfall of that technique is if you leave the reference track in and you go and you try and create a similar song to that with the sounds you've chosen. I'm talking about using a reference track and literally just using it to pull out. Um, if you picture an electronic music uh, piece of music as being played by a band, it's like, who are the band members? Mm-hmm. You know, what are the instruments that are in there? It doesn't mean that your song is going to sound the same as that band. It just means you want to create a piece that has similar instrumentation. And it gives you that checklist. So after that, wipe the reference track and get rid of it. Um, At that point, I actually like to use a second reference track. And in this case, it's a reference track where I like the song structure. So song structure, songwriting is another huge area where people struggle. And I mean, I'm a classically trained uh, musician. I, I've done music theory training. I, I, I play and write jazz music. And I don't like creating in a vacuum. Um, so somebody who doesn't have a musical background, it's, it's more and more difficult for. So I love pulling up songs where I just like the way they flow. And I'll, I'll throw that into Ableton Live. I'll chop them up into, into segments. And I'll say, you know, verse, chorus, chorus, verse, verse, bridge, if it's arranged like a pop song or it might be intro breakdown build up drop b section if you want to use kind of track terminology but to learn from the song structure and what i do with those at that point is i then also delete the the song but i have a set of um of markers Mm -hmm. or i do it sometimes just with blank midi clips and i have uh, basically a song template at that point and then i take that um midi track um in live and I drag that into my user library. So I have these song templates that I can bring up. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a really big fan of uh, certain artists that are using pop song structures, but it's in electronic music. A good example of that would be like Flume or San Holo or Louis the Child or Muramasa and stuff like that. A lot of future bass music is written with pop song structuring. And I was fascinated by it. I wanted to see what about this makes this song work. And um, we, you touched on my interest in personal development earlier. And that's where I'll bring in something here. So as a coach, I'm constantly educating and training myself on personal development techniques that can be useful for musicians. It's just an area of passion for me. So uh, one particular area is called NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. 
And it's the study, it's the study of excellence is what it is. And it was created by um, human behavioral psychologists as a way of figuring out how we perform at peak levels. So NLP or neuro linguistic programming. And it tries to identify what they call the difference that makes the difference. And it requires intense study and observation of something that you want to figure out how to reverse engineer. And so I became really fascinated with reverse engineering structures and patterns, figuring out what is the pattern that creates this result and what is the pattern that creates failure? What's the pattern that creates success? Uh, so you can model that. It doesn't mean that you're going to create an exact replica, but it means you're going to model it. Mm. You're going to sort of set the stage to have those factors in the right order. Yeah, that's, that's a great yeah. idea. Um, I've for a long time and I haven't done it yet so I've, it was sort of like this like project I wanted to do and so I haven't really talked about it too much but <laughs> since I haven't done it yet what the hell maybe someone else would do it, it sounds like you're doing it already uh, but I've had this idea of just maybe analyzing like the top songs of the last say 30-40 years or something pop songs or whatever um, and, and make those MIDI clips that you can just drag into live as a track and then just have okay, well, here's um, you know, Madonna's borderline song structure, you know, and we can follow that, you know, where this is where this happens, this is where this happens, because that is like I find for me, like I love working in session view, inside live, where you can get all your loops and ideas together, you can fill your palette, and then getting to arrangement view is where you kind of make the decisions, but that's a hard transition. And to have something that's sort of tried and true, I think is a really smart idea. Um, so yeah, that's, that's cool. That's something I want to work on. And I think you also made a really great point that I don't think a lot of electronic musicians think of, but coming from like a rock background, the instrumentation is always the same. It's the same drum kit usually with the band, right? They play the same drum kit, the same guitar, same bass, maybe keys, same singers. It doesn't change as wildly as electronic music does, yet how many songs were hits and wildly different from each other too with that particular format. Totally. Yeah, 100%. It, it, just because you're choosing the same list of sounds mm. um, and you're never going to have the same sounds, they're, you're, they're just going to be inspiring you. You can mm -hmm. say, okay, well, this song has a call and response bass line and there's maybe there's four bass presets and they're all really mid-rangey modulated bass presets like something you would hear out of serum or phase plant or massive and you can say okay well i'm going to create these i'm going to use wavetable synths and i'm going to create these crazy modulated basses they're not going to sound like the original ones from the song you're not going to be able to these producers are not using presets in most cases mm -hmm. so even if you they were it'd be hard to find them you're going to create your own sounds that are loosely inspired by but different than yeah, even that very specific description you gave of the bass sounds would yield a whole world of different results. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 100%. I love that, though, that idea of the difference that makes the difference. Very cool. Very, like, catchy thing, but it's so true. I mean, to identify that stuff is important. Have you found anything in particular that helps you? Any, like, major breakthroughs that make the difference? Is your own workflow, your own process? Um, yeah, yeah, totally. I, um, my, um, I would say headspace going into <laughs> writing a new song, how I, how I'm approaching it, you know? So for, um, I've just realized in my own personal process that I prefer mornings mm -hmm. that, uh, and there's scientific reasons why, um, that's the case. Uh, I'm an avid researcher in the field of neurotomization and nutrition like that i spent the brain um and i know that every decision that you make in the day wears down your level of willpower mm -hmm. so at the end of the day you're at your lowest level of focus you're at your lowest level of um discipline than you are at the beginning of the day and this is why a lot of people who have day jobs struggle with writing music when they come home and they try and do it after a long day mm -hmm. doing whatever they're doing and after a big heavy dinner their energy's tanked and so for me, it's really important to set myself up correctly at the beginning. So I've cultivated a mindset that I'm a morning person and being a morning person or not being a morning person is a mindset. If somebody tells you they're not a morning person, they're going to suck in the morning. They're going to be mm -hmm. 
tired and grumpy and but i've 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 cultivated the mindset that i'm a morning person and i'm sharp i'm mentally sharp in the morning and i feel my most creative um also i know scientifically that my discipline and my focus are higher so i'll clear a weekend i like to work on music on my weekends because during the week warp academy um dominates a lot of my time and i want to give my creative energy to that company but on the weekends uh that's kind of clear time where i know i can just spend an entire day in the studio and um i'll start my day with um, mind training so for me meditation has made a profound difference mm. a lot of us understand that um, that we need to go to the gym and we need to train our physical bodies by lifting weights and doing flexibility, mobility exercises, doing yoga, running, things like that to have our physical bodies stay in good health and to be capable and strong. Uh, and our minds are exactly the same way, yet very, very few of us um, do anything to discipline or train the mind. So I view meditation as mind training. And that helps me as a music producer because it's relying entirely on your mental fortitude there's a fantastic book on this actually called stealing fire it's a recent book um i've read it about three times now and they study um the field of peak performance and they study the field of being in the flow state so for any artist i highly highly recommend they talk about everything from meditation to using um hallucinogenic uh substances like lsd uh they cover things like float tanks and they look at what some of the world's peak performers are doing to hack the flow state. So this includes, uh, for example, Navy SEAL Team 6 or the group that's otherwise known as Dev Group. They have a mind gym for these elite soldiers. Um, these are soldiers that at any point in time could be deployed on any continent in the world. They need to know how to speak a multitude of languages. And they found that using meditation and mindfulness-like techniques, such as sensory deprivation and floating in a float tank, They've been able to, for example, shrink the amount of time it takes a Navy SEAL in SEAL Team 6 to learn a new language from six months to six weeks. Wow. So the difference is profound. Mm. These are exponential multiples of difference here. And so I pull on those techniques when I go into the studio to create music and I meditate. Uh, I've been an avid meditator for about 15 years now. Uh, I sit for usually 45 minutes or an hour. I had to work up to that. But before I go into the studio, and then I also will use supplements, um, nootropic supplements. So nootropics is a field generally um, aimed at increasing mental performance. And uh, I'll throw some book recommendations out there. I love this book called Optimum Nutrition for the Mind by Patrick Holford, who runs the ION. It's an institute for optimum nutrition in uh, the UK. And he ran a pivotal study that showed that he could increase the IQ of school children by up to 20 points by using nutritional supplements. 20 points is the difference between a plumber and a physicist, by the way. <laughs> so uh, it's massive. So uh, I started studying his work and I'll use things like um, L-theanine, uh, which induces an alpha brainwave state, uh, which is when you're focused or you're passively learning. I'll use other supplements like um, fish oil, or phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylcholine that are correlated with uh, memory. I'll be, uh, I'll, may, I'll maybe wrap up there because I could go deep into this for hours and hours. <laughs> and it's a, it's a huge area of, uh, of, of interest. But uh, uh, suffice it to say, I try and hack the creativity process as much as possible using mind training and nutritional supplementation so that when I go into the studio, I'm, I'm sharp, I'm at my best, and I create superior results in that amount of time, that window of time that I have. Well, um, from my experience interacting with you, you're always sharp and on the point. So I think it's, it's working <laughs> out. And seriously, it's, it's something that um, has always been an impression I left with whenever I speak with you. It's, you're very, very um, focused and um, detail-oriented. And um, I, I, I got a lot out of that working with you with our, with our video course, actually. Oh, Attention thank to you. The detail. And um, I think um, you know everything was clear, very easy to, to follow directions on very complicated subjects. But yeah, making a course is crazy complicated for sure, and um, you you rocked it. I, I really to to, to this <laughs> day the push to jumpstart course is uh, is going strong, man. Well, what you said though, like about like the mind training, it's something I, I've kind of always thought. Like I never really understood the separation between body and mind. Because it's in your body. Your mind is this physical thing in your body. So it, it is really important to pay attention to how you think, what you think about, what you're doing inside your head. 
I, I'm nowhere near you in the experience as meditation, but I've found just the process of like sitting and observing what your crazy mind is doing all the time. I mean, it's like walking around with someone that will never shut up and they're just yelling in your ear all day long. And to just pay attention to what you're, what you're yelling in your ear is really powerful because sometimes we say things to ourselves that you would never say to your worst enemy. Totally. It can be really harsh and it really can defeat your spirit. Your creative energy can be zapped real fast. I know sometimes where I'm making music, or, or I mean any activity really, but especially music making, where there's always a point where that thing creeps in and it's like, your song sucks, man. That sound is stupid. You don't know how to do it. Like, there's always that like evil villain <laughs> that likes to show up. Totally. This is something they discuss on length, actually, in Stealing Fire. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about how um, what distinguishes human beings from uh, animals in the animal kingdom is the the size and power of our our prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the ability, which is um, unparalleled in other species, to delay gratification to work towards long-term goals collectively. And uh, we don't need to uh, be receiving this instantaneous gratification to uh, spur us on to activity. Uh, the prefrontal cortex in, in humans is uh, an amazing evolution. However, it comes with uh, another side. It's a double-edged sword. And that is the inability sometimes to get out of our own heads. Mm -hmm. And this is why you see so much... Uh, uh, behavior that is, uh, you could call it drug seeking behavior. You know, people that are, that are using substances to try and get out of their own heads it could be marijuana, it could be alcohol. It could be other things. It could be Netflix. It could be who knows what Yeah, food, just games, distraction. Yeah. So. Distraction because it, it's kind of excruciating to always be subjected to that voice. And so we need a mechanism to get out of our own heads. And, and this is a huge part of stealing fire. And so they mm -hmm. talk about, um, these uh, things that can get us out of our own head. So they, they in the book, they, they use things like um, fMRIs uh, to be able to scan what the brain is doing when it's in the flow state. And then they attempt to recreate that mix of neurotransmitters. So you have neurotransmitters in your brain like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin, all of those are neurotransmitters. And there's this cocktail of neurotransmitters always happening in our brains. And so their philosophy with the book is if you can figure out what the cocktail of flow state looks like, you can use things to recreate it. And so the devices have come out of that line of thought like uh, this thing called the God Helmet where they studied what someone who was having a deep religious profound experience, what their brain looked like from a brainwave perspective. And then they sought to recreate that using a helmet that could send electromagnetic pulses at different regions of the brain. And they've been to, able to successfully recreate those, those states. Um, meditation is also something that is profound in what it does to the brain. You know, um, avid and deep meditators who have had a long practice, I'm talking 10,000 hours or more, of practice and meditation can bring their brainwave into uh, a brainwave rate called theta, which we're typically in when we're sleeping. It's very deep brainwaves. They can also um, selectively deactivate the right parietal lobe of the brain, which is responsible for our sense of uh, what is us and what is other. And so by selectively deactivating these parts of the brain, we free up um, think about it in terms of computers, RAM and CPU. We free up RAM and CPU that can then be devoted towards bigger problems. More So you're basically, by engaging in some form of mind training, uh, you're freeing up mental CPU and RAM to be able to focus more on your creative pursuits is, uh, is, is kind of what they talk about. Mm. Oh, that sounds great. I'm, I'm on a, a little journey myself um, with some of this stuff. Uh, like I said, trying to make meditation a more constant practice even just a few minutes is really powerful um i look forward to the t day when i can get to something a little bit longer um but just a uh, personal organization has actually been a, a a thing i'm working on right now um to just clear the mind of all the things that we have to worry about and keep track of all the time it's it's again it's like freeing that ram and that cpu just so that you can, you know, when when I go to make music, I know I don't, I'm not leaving seven other things on, you know, undone, 
that I'm going to remember suddenly that I have to do. It's like, no, I know that I don't, I, I'm not doing that right now. And I'm okay with that. I've made the decision because I, I'm, I will, uh, ver- and I, th- I think this is especially true when you're, when your workspace is in your home. Like, so my, all my studio stuff is at home. When I go to school yeah. to teach, you know, it's all there. I'm in the mode and it's easy to get in there. But when I'm home, like, let's say I decide I'm going to just take a break and watch some Netflix. I do that with a lot of guilt. Like I should be, mm. I should be doing this. I should be doing. I should have, you know. There's this like kind of like um, part of my mind that's just coming up with all the other things I should probably be doing instead. But by focusing on uh, keeping better track of that stuff, getting it down on paper and organized, I'm finding I'm able to do those things without the guilt as much, mm-hmm. and be more present in what I'm doing. Yeah, I think that's important. I think um, when there's a, a element of guilt that's playing a role in our in our lives, it can be really uh, damaging. Mm-hmm. And I think like, you know, there's, if you're not binging a whole season of a series every night on Netflix, you know, watching a few episodes of something on, on Netflix every once in a while can be great. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I watch Netflix. Uh, you know, I, I love watching movies and stuff like that. I try it's not to do it every every too. evening. But it can be, yeah, it can be totally inspiring. And there's sometimes where, you know, during my work, you know, my evenings are the times that I tend to tend towards rest and recuperation. And I definitely um, like giving myself uh, a good amount of downtime and recuperation from the rest of my very busy and very full on uh, life. And so, yeah, man, like sometimes I just like making a really nice dinner and um, throwing on a movie. Same thing with food, even though I have, I'm avidly into the field of health and nutrition and I eat um, a really, really clean diet. Um, every once in a while, I want to crush some ice cream. Mm-hmm. And if I'm feeling guilty about that, then, you know, there's, there's, I try and enjoy it joyfully. And, uh, and, and, and it's, can be easier said than done but like just to just to really monitor that self-talk to be an observing party where you're seeing the thoughts that are coming up and saying you know that's a destructive thought you can be like when's the last time i had ice cream it's been like three weeks or something like that i've been going to the gym i've been going to yoga i've been biking i've been eating salads i've been staying on top of my nutrition a bowl of ice cream right now is awesome i have a naturopathic doctor that i work with and he says i don't really care about anything you do once a week if it's once a week you have a coffee once a week you've got to you know eat some pizza once a week you eat a bowl of ice cream Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and what's the point in doing those things if you're not going to really enjoy it anyway you know like if i'm i'm going to watch my netflix or eat my ice cream and i'm just going to think about how bad i'm being (laughs) like you're not actually enjoying it anyway so that defeats the whole purpose of even doing it yeah totally (laughs) funny it's it's the mind is like such a dirty player in our lives sometimes if you're not paying attention to it yeah, hundred hundred percent. Monitoring what it's saying is uh, is a big part of mindfulness mm-hmm. um, and uh, being aware of the of the self talk and things like that. Because we can have this little friend of mine who's a coach calls it the the, the stealth bomber. You know, it's mm-hmm. that voice if it goes under the radar and you don't realize what it's saying, it can be so damaging. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when you're talking about music. You know, we all have these moments where we judge what we're doing and. You know, we think that our song sucks. Like I have, I've had so many musicians who I consider like really prolific, amazing musicians that have openly talked about like hating their own stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we, you know, right up to the top of the top levels, we all deal with this in, in some respect, but there's people who figured out healthy ways of handling that. Um, and then there's other people who get mired up in it and they get stopped and they get stuck. And so cultivating a really healthy attitude around that, which is realizing it for the insanity that it is, or being able to place it aside. So like, uh, you know, in meditation, it's not like the goal is to have a completely clear mind that very rarely happens even after decades of practice, but it's to be able to acknowledge those thoughts like a bubble in a glass of soda. Say you have a glass of soda. Meditation is like those bubbles are coming up. One of those bubbles might be a thought that, hey, I have this bill that I need to pay for my internet. And you're like, you can acknowledge it and say, you know what? Now's not the time. I'm going to release that and let it go. And the bubble pops on the surface of the water. Another thought might come up saying, you know, um, I really suck as a musician and I don't think I'm going to be able to write any songs that I'm happy with. And you can look at that and realize it as just a thought that's popping up and you could acknowledge it and let it, let it bubble away. And then you bring your mind back to your breath or whatever you're focusing on. So that talent, that skill that you build through discipline is super useful. Not when you're sitting on the meditation mat, Mm -hmm. it's really useful 
in addition in the studio. So you're in the studio and you have maybe you want to get distracted and you want to go look at gear or you want to go look at some tutorial on YouTube. And you know that's going to take you away from the song you're working on. But maybe you've hit a moment in your song where it's difficult and we have to persevere get over that hurdle to be able to make progress in the song. But a lot of times the internet's on and then Facebook pops up. And next thing you know, you're texting somebody and, and you're down a rabbit hole because you want to distract yourself from the discomfort of breaking through that obstacle. So meditation is that mental fortitude piece. It's the mental training that gets you to stay the course and to be able to place that stuff aside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I do okay when I'm able to recognize like I'm having that thought. Um, I, I've, I haven't had it actually in a little while, but um, this like imposter syndrome feeling coming over me, whether it's through my music, whether it's as a teacher a lot actually, like because because that's such a huge responsibility to have like thirty kids, teenagers every single day listening to me for 40 minutes sometimes i i get in my head and i'm like i don't belong up there what who allowed me to do this you know <laughs> but to just get it in to realize that like you said it's the bubble or it's it's just this thought that's coming up it doesn't mean be, because i'm having the thought doesn't mean it's true but it's very yeah. easy to get sucked in like the whirlpool of it and just follow it and stick with that thought but the ability yep. to just understand that it's only a thought, it's not anything based in reality, is yep. powerful. Yeah, I try and think about that thing as like some little demon, this little gargoyle that's like <laughs> in the room, and it's like, you suck. And I'm like, oh, somebody's feeling a little spicy today. What, uh, somebody piss on your Doritos last night there, Bob? You know, I just try, try and demean the little thing and try and look yeah. at it like this, this little creature that just wants to like cut you down. Ah, you fucking suck. <laughs> ah, your music's terrible. You know, and, yeah. and I'm just like, oh, that's, oh, that's cute. You're just, uh, yeah, you're just doing your thing. Yeah. Why don't you go, why don't you go away, hide in the closet? <laughs> you know, something that is, is um, stuck with me from a conversation I had with Drew Mayhills, who's another certified trainer, I spoke to him oh, yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Oh, no um, way. That's awesome. I've been talking to him too. Oh, cool. The other, the other, the other Drew yeah, uh, right. in, <laughs> in Australia, right? Yeah. Yep. Super cool. Yeah, totally cool guy. And um, he was talking about how he's like, um, he, he like sort of outsources his criticism. So he lets his, he's got some trusted people that he knows that aren't just going to be like, you're so good at music. Wow, that track is amazing. You know, when they really hate it, they'll tell him, he'll tell him the truth. He'll get an honest opinion. So he's got, he, he, we came, I don't know if he said it or whatever, but like this idea of outsourcing your criticism has been a fun thing for me. Like, I, I'm going to give that job to someone else. You know, that's not, it's not my job to critique this. It's just my job to make it. It's just my job to do it. And someone else totally. will come along. And it's, a, it's just a mental trick, but it's surprisingly powerful. I want to get that like written somewhere the next time I get that feeling. Like, yeah. Yeah, totally. And if you have, you know, cultivate a circle of people around you that maybe you're exchanging feedback with on mm -hmm. tracks. You know, I think that's really valuable, um, especially when they're other professionals, mm -hmm. you know, like if you're sending it to like one of your buddies, um, you're going to get a strong opinion back. Like, I like this song because it's my style or I don't like this song. And it's really easy to get caught up in this music is good or this music is bad. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, uh, for me, I've tried to cultivate a circle of people very close to me that are other engineers there are other professional music producers, sound designers, mix engineers, um, label owners. And I have a group of five or six people around me that I exchange music with. And when it's at the point where I'm, I'm feeling pretty done with it, I send it out to them and I ask them for feedback. And they know, and the type of feedback that they give is very um, uncolored, objective feedback. So they might say something like, uh, you know what, I think the sub's a bit too heavy in this one for the genre by about 2 dB. Or they might say, um, you know, that transition that you made from chorus, the chorus sound uh, enough energy contrast with the verse. So when the chorus hits, it doesn't sound like a big enough chorus. And I would consider doing these five things. Mm -hmm. the, the quality of feedback that I'm getting from those people is extremely good. 
And um, I do the same thing for them because we're peers. So I, um, you could call that an MBA, a mentor board of advisors. And uh, I really like that process of cultivating relationships with other people that are at an equal level to you in the industry and um, doing a kind of feedback exchange um, privately. Because mm-hmm. uh, I think it, you know, who you expose your music to before it's done is, um, is a, a very critical process. And if you expose your music to the wrong people and get bad quality feedback, then you might never finish that song. Mm-hmm. Whereas somebody who you send it to might be like, oh, yeah, the song's great, but maybe something about the mix isn't, you know, and a person with untrained ears isn't going to hear that. So, yeah, yeah I, I think that that feedback process, outsourcing the, the criticism is, is really good. Um, and being intentional about who those people are, for sure, has been a huge benefit uh, for me. Mm. Now you you mentioned um I kind of wanted to touch on this a little bit. You were you kind of mentioned the distinction between um the we have like the producer today which is the person that makes the beat, makes the song, writes it, plays all the instruments, but then we have the more like traditional role of the producer. Um is are these types of things you bring in like these like kind of um tips, productivity things, these um some of the mental hacks, even the mind training. Um, what what it kind of what does that look like when you're in the more um, the traditional old school producer hat compared to like the you know person on Ableton Live with their laptop? Yeah. So you mean if I've been hired as a producer and I'm right. working with an artist, yes, you know, exactly. like what what how would that change what I'm what I'm bringing in? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, it's it's interesting because I I am um, I I wear a lot of hats in in what I do and I'm 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 a sound designer audio engineer so I can speak to things on that level and I do with the people that I'm acting as a producer for and sometimes I'm helping them swap out sounds in their songs mm-hmm. um, but a lot of times it's up a level from there so it's acting more strategic and it's guiding the whole creation of the song and thinking about what the song needs and what's going to serve the song best. And, uh, absolutely. There's a lot of mindset stuff that will happen. I think, um, you know, when people hire me, um, it, for one-on-one lessons and I'm, I'm helping them more with like mixing or sound design, or I'm ghostwriting for them. Um, it's pretty technical. It's mostly technical stuff. And I don't delve into the, you know, meditation and the mind training and the, you know, no tropics and the personal development as much, but sometimes people come to me and it's not a technical problem that they're having. They're coming to me and they know that it's a mindset uh, issue. Mm -hmm. And because being an artist is a, it can be torturing. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's at the best of times. um, It's like starting a business. It's like being an entrepreneur, being an artist, you're, you're self-employed. You're, um, you're trying to create something from nothing and you're trying to carve out something that's unique. That's going to be, have traction in a very noisy and competitive market. And so, And people tie their music so intimately with their sense of self-worth that it brings up a lot of emotional Mm. junk in us uh, that can wipe us out. And so I, uh, I, I, as an entrepreneur, my journey, uh, you know, goes way back before Warp Academy. I've been an entrepreneur for many, many, many years. Um, I started my first business when I was 19. So I've, I'm, I've had to encounter a lot of that stuff and find ways to work through it. And as a result, in you know the past twenty years of my life, I've I've done a, in a huge amount of personal development work, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so I, I I bring a lot of that stuff in when I'm working with somebody as a producer because a lot of it is uh, is upper level mindset stuff and and resiliency and how can you stay feeling creative and feel fulfilled in what you're doing. Um, so so yeah, I, I would say that uh, it it I'm I'm more in a mentorship role um, at that point. Uh, yeah, a different kind of coach there. Yeah, yeah. that that's interesting because it's. Uh, I think again, like you, you know, you're saying like um, we were saying before, like you really learn something when you teach it, and th- it's it's a nice feedback loop, I'm sure too, when you see your artists, you know, making those developments, and you, you get not only the feedback that it works for you, but it works for them as well. Yeah, totally. It's always a, a great moment when somebody that I'm working with gets their song signed to a label mm-hmm. or breaks through and, and, and gets a really significant gig, you know, and uh, actually the, the woman that I'm, I'm in her studio right now, um, Kristen, who goes by Lady K, we've been working together and I've been acting f- for her as a producer. And uh, just this last year, she had her, her first two songs signed. 
and released on 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 labels and then she got booked for a major festival and then mm-hmm. she got onto uh, a radio show in Ibiza and then now she's gonna get uh, probably a gig at uh, at ADE in Amsterdam and so I'm seeing her career you know begin to open up and flourish and uh, it's always great to um, you know she uh, has been voracious in implementing what I've said not everybody uh, does some people take the advice and then, you know, they, it falls off the radar, but she's been exceptional at, uh, implementing, uh, what we've talked about and, uh, she's seeing a huge amount of success as a result. And so for me, it's great to see, you know, songs get out in public and, and for people to, to begin to get uh, real substantial traction. Hmm. That's awesome. I'm, I'm sure you see a lot of that, you know, with your, your own personal worth at work ethic and your philosophies behind what you do. It's, it's, um, I think it's and it's apparent, you know, when when you visit, say, Warp Academy, that there's like um, a certain sort of philosophical backbone to it, where it's not just like, okay, guys, we're gonna make a new bass sound. I mean, there is that too, but um, there's also something a little deeper that that you had a great video that everyone should check out. The five focus and productivity hacks was uh, was a real. Cool. I really like that direction of of the site. I think that's a cool thing and. Um, I look forward to the um, soundproofing video too because it's just another cool aspect of what we do that is definitely misunderstood a lot. And it's it's really, it's like a whole other field, honestly, from being a music producer. But it's still yeah. something that probably a lot of us need to address. I know I probably should myself. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating field. And that's one of the things that makes being a music producer so technical and so challenging is you need to be kind of proficient in all of these areas. Yeah. And I mean, sure, if you've, if, you've got a, uh, if you've got a big budget, you can hire somebody else to do all that for you. But mm-hmm. a lot of us aren't in that, in that situation and people are bootstrapping and they're trying to make ends meet, you know, working a day job and, and they're trying to buy audio plugins and samples and invest into their studio. And so hiring somebody to come in and build a custom studio for them isn't on the radar. And so you kind of have to learn about these things and educate yourself. But the nice and the lucky thing is right now is that unlike, you know, when you and I got started, um, there's so many amazing resources that are available online. You know, obviously our YouTube channel at Warp Academy is one of them. We publish a video a week pretty much. But uh, there's there's, um, many, many uh, people that are experts in various areas that are creating really compelling, um, really valuable, high quality content. And you can find a lot of that. Uh, and, and as well, if you want to go and take something that is um, curated and put into a really nice learning path, there's also relatively inexpensive courses on many of these subjects as well mm-hmm. that people can take. So we live in a world where information is really at our fingertips, and it comes down to your your personal discipline in being willing to sit through and you know play like you're in school. And, you know, because a lot of music producers aren't taking structured classes like it, like you have at Berkeley. A lot of people are kind of taking random YouTube videos and trying to compile stuff together and try and learn DIY style. And, um, you know, I think if we, if we take the mindset of, hey, I'm studying right now, I'm going to spend the next two or three years studying my craft and putting this in, the information is there. It just, just takes a lot of discipline to be able to, to put it together and sit down in front of it, make notes and, and really learn it at a deep level. And I think, as you mentioned before, with Lady K, you said, is her name? Lady yeah. K? Yeah. One of the main, the big differentiations between the people that are able to succeed is it's it's not a, a, a matter of having the information anymore. It's really applying and getting to work and showing up. And like you said, she's been voracious about implementing all of the stuff that you guys do together. And, and it's... It's a beautiful time that we have all this information, but it's also very easy to use learning as sort of a procrastination tool and to avoid the work. Discipline. Yeah. It, it, it's funny how it all just comes down to. <laughs> it's, the, the rule hasn't changed as the technology has. It's really, you got to just do it. You got to work. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that uh, as as amazing as it is to have YouTube at our fingertips, it is also the destroyer of a lot of productivity because mm-hmm. it's super easy if you're in the studio and, like I said, you're 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 there to work on a piece of music, and you're going to have lots of time process where you come up with something you're struggling with. 
You know, maybe it's like getting to the drop of your song and you're trying to write a really good bass melody and it's just not coming together. The temptation at that point to bail and go to the internet or to pick up your phone and start texting somebody is so huge because it takes us away from the discomfort of Mm -hmm. feeling like we're not capable. Whereas that's the exact opposite thing that's going to allow you to make progress. So, you know, I don't, I try my best not to rely on discipline because discipline only gets you so far when you're having to use willpower. Um, you have finite reserves of willpower. Mm -hmm. It's that's something that's unequivocal. Um, and I try not to use my reserve of willpower for things like that. So I use in myself productivity apps like vitamin R, um, is a productivity app that's loosely based on the Pomodoro method. And it uh, has, uh, I also use apps like Freedom and Antisocial that have the ability to block your internet access for a period of time. Mm-hmm. And I find that extremely uh, useful uh, because then I don't even have the option. Right. It's like, um, I also go on, uh, it's, a, it's a term from jazz, actually jazz musicians, we call it going into the woodshed. Uh-huh. And it's when a musician maybe before a tour or something like that, when they need to go and brush up and and get at peak performance, they literally would go out into isolation somewhere, cabin in the woods or something like that. And they would just be there in focus land and away from any possible, yeah, practice, just practice, practice, practice. And so in the studio, I try to digitally recreate that. It's not really feasible for me to take my studio and disassemble it and put it up in a cabin in the woods. Like I need my mix studio with my, proper treatment and all that stuff. But I, I try and digitally recreate that going into the woodshed kind of thing. Like everybody around me knows don't come into that room. (laughs) And uh, my phone is in another, on another floor of the house. It's nowhere near me and my internet's turned off and it's blocked. And I know that I've got eight hours ahead of me and I'm working on this song. And, uh, you know, that's huge. But professor Vespers, (laughs) <laughs> what if there's an emergency? What if something comes up that I just need to hear? <laughs> yeah, you know, I've never had something like that actually happen. <laughs> I I take breaks. Uh, you know, yeah. when I'm in the zone and I'm I'm doing a mix down, for example, that's deep work. Mm. Uh, also, also the name of another great book to to read, Deep Work. And uh, you know, Cal, there's uh, is that Cal? Um, drawing a blank on his name, the author Cal. Yeah, I don't I, recall the, the author's name uh, either. I know, but I, this uh, is like a book. I think it's in my uh, Audible uh, wish list nice. right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, doing any type of music writing, especially mixing, where it's going to take you hours, um, days, days to mix a track c- correctly. Um, that's deep work. And so for me, it's essential to be away from distraction. But mm. taking breaks is a big part of that. Every couple hours, you know, I'll, I'll come up and stretch, you know, take a breath of fresh air, do, a, you know, whatever, grab a bite to eat or a cup of green tea or something like that. And in that time, I go and I look at my phone, mm-hmm. you know, so I, is there, I think that the, the sense of fear that you call it FOMO, right? Mm-hmm. That we're going to miss out on something uh, if we don't constantly have our phone glued to us is a type of uh, anxiety that really needs to get assessed. Yeah. Um, because look at the cost of it. And the cost of it is you are in what they call continuous partial attention. It is impossible for you to do deep work when your phone is buzzing and beeping around you, when growl notifications are popping up on your computer. It is impossible for you to maintain a deep level of focus. You're going to be compromised. There's times when it doesn't matter if you're in deep work. If you're answering email or you're chatting with people on Facebook, you're maybe trying to get some bookings and you're talking to promoters, like, no problem. Leave the growl notifications up. Have your phone on you. Be accessible. But then there are times that I block off behind the curtains for deep work. And um, yeah, I've, I, I've personally never had something come up where like, I basically tell you know, the people around me, I'm like, don't come and get me unless the house is burning down. Mm-hmm. You know? So if the house is burning down, yeah, come get me. <laughs> get me out. But uh, I haven't, uh, I, you know, short of that, um, don't interrupt me. That's super smart. I mean, I, I will maybe turn off the internet, um, but it's almost like putting the cookies in the cabinet instead of not having cookies in the house. So what you're saying is this, it's not going to use your willpower because you can't get on the internet. You can't use your phone instead of like just, because I guess every 
couple minutes, probably you have to make the decision not to go on the internet, not to use the phone if you don't have it like literally blocked from you. So, yeah, you know, when you put it that way, it makes a, a lot of sense um, to do that because the best way to, to not eat junk food is to not have it around you. If you have to walk past the donuts yeah. seven times during the day, you know, oh. you might break down. It only yeah. takes one time to break down. Totally. Yeah, the worst the worst thing you can do is imagine it's at Christmas time and there's a bottle of Baileys sitting on the counter. And every time you walk past that bottle of Baileys, you know you want to have a sip of it, so <laughs> you can't have that stuff around. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's great. I gotta I gotta do more of that. I, I I rely on discipline, and you're right. I'm 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 making the decision not to do it too many times, and it's it should just not even come up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it does. It wears you down. And I just had to really observe that in myself, uh, realize that it was it took something every time I had to make that choice. And then also in, um, I don't think it was Stealing Fire, I think it was another book, it was called The Power of Full Engagement, where they talk about um, the cost of having to use your discipline. And they cited actual studies where they um, asked, they, they were testing uh, willpower at that point in time. And so the test that they did actually was they had a, a control group and then they had a, a survey group. And in the survey group, they put a plate of cookies in front of them and they asked them to not have a cookie. So they had to use willpower to not have a cookie. And then they gave both groups, the control and the test group, uh, like a, a skill testing list of questions. And the group that had had to resist the cookie, thus depleting their willpower partially, didn't persist anywhere near as long through the list of questions wow. and performed more poorly on the subsequent test. Wow. So just and there's lots of studies like that, that <laughs> test, the test willpower. Uh, so it's a, you know, like when I'm talking about this stuff, it's not speculation. Like mm -hmm. these are researched proven facts. Yeah. That's insane. So just having some cookies in the room is enough to, <laughs> you said there's no food to make you a better music producer, but maybe there is uh the trick of not having the treats around will make you a better music producer. <laughs> yeah, they could. They could. Perhaps. I think it's, and I think maybe there are, there are foods that can make you a better music producer in that when you're eating clean and mm -hmm. you're well nourished, um, that you are able to put more rubber to the road creatively because you're in a better mind yeah. space. I know for myself, if I go and I eat a really, really big, heavy lunch, I go have, have something that, like pasta meat and stuff yeah. like that you know like a heavy dense meal my energy tanks necessarily again because where does the blood go in your body it goes to that big ball of food in your stomach and it, a lot of energy and trying to break that down so during the day if i'm in and out of the studio and i'm trying to do a day of mixing i go and i have smoothies light smoothies still very nutrient dense but the blender has already effectively pre-digested it for you mm. and so when that those nutrients go into your body they're already mostly broken down they basically go s almost straight to energy or um, even better i've been experimenting with fasting and the concept of intermittent fasting a lot of people that are studying the keto diet understanding ketone production and things like that understand the mental clarity benefits that can come from that so sometimes i'll have green tea with something like MCT oil in it, which uh, gets treated biologically like a carbohydrate where it can give you energy. It can get used immediately by your cells and muscles as energy, but it's not um, causing your body to uh, go into digestion mode mm. effectively. Yeah. That's super cool. So what's next for you, sir? What's on the horizon? Anything new you can talk about, share with us? Yeah, totally. Um, there yeah, always thanks, is, man. I know, yeah. There always, there always is. We're always up to stuff. Um, so yeah, two or three things I'll share real quick. Um, one is we uh, we did we always do surveys of our audience at Warp Academy because uh, I really I think we have a, we have an amazing community. Um, there's so many incredibly talented music producers that have uh, you know come into our field since we since we launched, and we love talking back and forth. And people have been amazing about giving us feedback on what they most want to learn so that we're not shooting in the dark. And uh, one of those topics is uh, mixing. And so we are getting into creating um, very uh, full-on training in mixing. 
I won't uh, say any more specifically what that's going to look like, but stay tuned on Warp Academy throughout the fall because we will make a major announcement in the field of mixing. And we're going to be pooling a lot of resources together and offering something that's never really been offered before that I've seen in the industry uh, in the field of advanced mixing for electronic music. Hmm. So that's coming up this fall. and that I'm exciting. I'm super excited about it. And it's based on um, our the feedback from about 50,000 people and what they wanted uh, as far as when it comes to mixing. Mm. The next big thing is, um, you know, every once in a while in the field of uh, web and online businesses, you need some renovations. And uh, Warp Academy's website as it exists right now was built in 2014. And it's uh, been a really, really great platform. We've had incredible feedback on the site and the design. And um, we've been really stoked with it. And through customer feedback, we've also identified a lot of new things that our customers uh, and members want. And uh, we are getting ready to launch a, a new platform that we've been in development of for the last six months. And um, it's got uh, a huge amount of, of new features, lots of exciting new stuff. And we will also be launching that um, this fall in the near term. So that's a really exciting project to be able to uh, kind of birth that into the world. Mm. It's been an incredible amount of hard work, but really fulfilling work. And I can't wait to uh, unveil it to you guys. Yeah, that. And then um, on the personal side, I've got some new releases that are coming up and my, my personal philosophy with music is I always like to make my music a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. So I don't just like, you know, putting songs out there, getting them signed to a label. And then that's that. I, um, I really like to use my music as a platform to show. Cause I mean, the, I, I teach stuff all the time in YouTube videos and in courses, but, um, a lot of times there's advanced stuff that I'm doing in my own music where seeing it in action, is really the most powerful way to learn, like seeing someone else's workflow. And so I have a few releases coming up uh, pretty quick over the next few months that uh, I'm also going to be uh, opening up the project files, doing live streams on them, um, fully showing how how I did what I did inside the projects. And it'll be showcasing a lot of stuff that I've kind of just been doing in my music in the last couple of years. Uh, so I'm really stoked to to be able to unveil that for our community as well. That sounds super cool. I, I look forward to all that stuff myself. I'll get a lot out of it, I'm sure. Nice one, man. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for giving me the opportunity to share. It's been uh, really, really awesome to uh, to hop on the show with you. Yeah, I, I knew it would be. Um, been looking forward to it for a while. Um, we can send people over to your site, right? We're going to... I mean, I, I assume the best place to send people is just right to warpacademy.com. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, warpacademy.com will hit our homepage. And then there you'll find uh, courses, online courses. You'll find live streams that we do. You'll find sound banks. And you'll find uh, a new audio software store uh, where we've partnered up with companies like FabFilter and Mastering the Mix. Mm. And you'll see um, not only are we selling those audio plugins, but for nearly every audio plugin we have listed in the store, we have a personally created Warp Academy video. Yeah. That accompanies that. So we have, um, uh, you know, not only selling the audio software, but we're actually training um, for free uh, how to use it as well. A couple other really, really good spots. We'd love it if you guys came and subscribed over at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Warp Academy. And uh, we do, yeah, tons of videos there. And we've got a series of about 13 different playlists on everything from sound design, mixing, mastering, songwriting, audio plugins, Ableton Live, all the juicy good stuff. And then the final thing I'll plug is uh, we created a group on Facebook uh, to be able to have uh, producers of all skill levels network together. Uh, we do things like remix competitions. We talk about audio software. It's kind of just a general sweet place to hang out and network with other people in the industry. And that group is called Nexus. Hmm. And uh, if you just go on Facebook and you search for Nexus, you'll see the Nexus Collective uh, offered by the Warp Academy page. And that's a great place to come and just if you want to kind of banter back and forth and, and meet uh, meet like-minded people. Hmm. Awesome. Those will all be in the show notes as well as about 700 book recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> I, I think I got most of them. But um, yeah, lots. Of, dude, this was really cool. I, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm, I'm uh, always looking for some good books and some good hacks and um i think i took a few gems away that are going to help me a lot in the future so i personally appreciate you giving your time 
and I'm pretty sure there's going to be some nice feedback on this episode. So thanks a lot for doing it. Oh, uh, you're most welcome, Brian. And uh, yeah, I'm really glad that uh, you got some personal value out of things as well. And yeah, yeah I always love swapping book recommendations with people. And uh, and uh, yeah, there's so much incredible knowledge out there that it's nice to get get some tips and focus in on some stuff that's really useful and relevant for musicians that can, that can help get us forward. So yeah, wish you all the best, my friend. And I hope we get to connect again real soon. And uh, yeah, hope the, uh, the episode turns out real great for everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for stopping by and thank you everyone for listening. Go to warpacademy.com, go to the YouTube channel, subscribe. You will not regret it. Lots of great stuff there. Lots to learn. Have a great day.